Jesus can save without people necessarily being aware of how they're being saved. It's very strongly supported in the Bible. You know, there are many people in the Bible before Christ who were saved through faith. They were saved even though Jesus hadn't yet died on the cross and rose again. And yet we believe that they were still saved through Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is What Your Pastor Didn't Tell You, Tim, I'm with Rebecca Davis. We're going to be talking about whether people that are outside of Christianity can be a Christian or can be saved, whether there's hope for them. Uh, how are you doing today, Rebecca? And can you give us just a little bit about your background? Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Zach. I'm glad to be here and I love talking about this subject. So my background is that I'm a Christian evangelist. I have a Master of Divinity, and I've been doing Christian ministry, mostly evangelism, also some pastoring and things like that, um, so for maybe 20 years now. And so I've spent three years in, I mean, I'm sorry, 10 years in three different Muslim-majority countries. And um, so I have a lot of experience sharing the gospel with Muslims, and I've written a book on that called Bridges of Love and Understanding how to bring the message of Jesus to Muslims and everyone else too. And so um, this is one of the topics that comes up um, with evangelism is what happens to the unevangelized. Is there hope for people who are in other religions? So um, this is one of the things that I'm passionate about discussing. Yeah, you have a really good book. I really appreciate it. Listening to all those crazy stories. Uh, all across the world and dealing with that that issue. So uh, you also, I don't know if you mentioned, you have your YouTube channel, Bread of, Bread of Life. And yes. uh, I, I really appreciate that and how you're actively talking with people that are not Christians, which is really cool to me. So um, what would you say is the view of Christian inclusivism? So Christian inclusivism is the view that everyone needs Jesus Christ for salvation, but people may not necessarily need to know the plan of salvation in order to be saved by Jesus Christ. So it's, you know, it, it's not saying that, oh, it's okay to be any religion. It's not, it's saying that Jesus Christ is the only way. Yes, he is. But that God can apply that salvation um, to anyone he wants. And so this is, you know, there are many people in the Bible before Christ who were saved through faith. They were saved even though Jesus hadn't yet died on the cross and rose again. And yet we believe that they were still saved through Jesus Christ. We believe Abraham, Noah, Moses, everybody, they're all getting saved through Jesus Christ, even though they lived and, and died before they you know, understood God's, the plan God had for salvation. And in the same way, there are people who have lived throughout history, even after Jesus died and rose again, who, even if they haven't heard of the plan of salvation, they can be affected by the plan of salvation. So inclusivism says that, you know, many people can be saved who haven't actually heard the gospel or confessed and trusted in Jesus in this lifetime. Yeah, that's I, well said. Uh, you know, that, to a lot of people, that's you know, that's kind of sound a little crazy. Uh, can you talk about some people like throughout history, or you know, popular uh, takers of the view that um, that have taken that view that people might not have heard of? Yeah, in fact, you know, one popular. Uh, Christian scholar that a lot of people read and love is C.S. Lewis. And so C.S. Lewis said this, we do know that no man can be saved except through Christ. We do not know that only those who know him can be saved through him. And I think that's a great way to succinctly describe inclusivism. It's that we know that no one can be saved without Jesus Christ, but we don't know who has, like if they actually need to know the plan in order to be saved by him. And so C.S. Lewis, he described this 
in his in the Chronicles of Narnia in the last battle, you know, there was do you know that did you read this, Zach? I did not read it. I watched the videos though. <laughs> okay. Well, in the last of the Chronicles of Narnia, the last battle, there's a, someone who was worshiping a false god named Tosh. And but it, in the end, that person was welcomed by Aslan, um, who is the Jesus figure. And the the person said, but I never served you. I, I was only serving Tosh the whole time. And so, but the Jesus figure says to him, no, actually you were serving me. You, you thought you were serving Tosh, but what you were doing were the, was the commands that I gave. So, um, you know, in the same way, like there, there are people who, you know, are, they may be serving, they may have the wrong theology, but their hearts are, uh, responding to the message of that the Holy Spirit is giving them. So that's, um, so C.S. Lewis was a big uh, person who promoted this idea and there's a lot more uh, written by him on this topic. Another person who did not fully do um, a, like a full scholarly treatment on this topic, but who seemed to hold some inclusivist ideas was John Wesley. So this is a quote from him on, uh, it's a, from a sermon called On Faith. And he says this, inasmuch as, as to them little is given, to, of them little will be required. No more, therefore, will be expected of them than the living up to the light they had. But many of them, we have great reason to hope, although they lived among the heathens, yet were quite of another spirit, being taught of God, by his inward voice, all the essentials of true religion. So this is John Wesley expressing about those, you know, who were not Christian by name, but who responded to the light that they had. And in fact, um, I will mention this, that, you know, there, there have been throughout Christian history theologians and scholars who held various views that were very similar to what we would call inclusivism. So there, you know, there was kind of the, the idea of universally accept, accessible salvation, which Thomas Aquinas and many of the scholastics held. And so they believed that salvation, that God would make salvation accessible to all, that everyone who ever lived would have the opportunity to trust in Christ in their lifetime. And so they may not have been fully inclusivist, but they they held on to these ideas. There were some early of the church fathers who were positive toward um, people of other religions being able to find salvation. And so some of those are, um, you know, Irenaeus and Clement of Rome, Clement of Alexandria. Um, so, it, you know, you can find some of these ideas that, um, you know, inclusivists hold. You can find them not, not in a complete theology, systematic theology, but you can find the ideas being expressed throughout Christian history. So um, you mentioned Peter Abelard, and I do have a, a, a great quote from him. And so um, this is from the writing Christian Theology, and he's speaking about noble pagans. He says, notable as they were in faith and life, we cannot doubt that they obtained indulgence of God or that their conduct and worship of the one God which they both held and made known by writing acquired for them the divine favor in the present existence and in the world to come along with the things necessary for salvation. Okay. <laughs> I feel like that's a, that's a, um, you know, a, kind of a difficult quote to parse out, but um, you know, it just shows you that these ideas about people who have not heard the good news or who have not trusted in Christ 
being able to obtain salvation or present, even as, you know, um, you know, a thousand years ago with Peter Abelard. And then finally, let, we can talk about some more, a more recent example, like Pope John Paul II, and the way that Catholicism, actually, this is the Cate um, uh, Vatican II teaching, is that people can be saved even if they have not trusted in Christ. And so it's the, the idea of the baptism of desire. So, and Pope John Paul exp expressed it here when he says, the gospel teaches us that those who live in accordance with the Beatitudes, the poor in spirit, the pure of heart, those who bear lovingly the sufferings of life will enter God's kingdom. All who seek God with a sincere heart, including those who do not know Christ and his church, contribute under the influence of grace to the building of this kingdom. Beautiful. Uh, another fun one is, of course, Billy Graham, although I've learned recently after posting about him that not everyone likes him very much. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, exactly. And actually, there's a long list. Of, there, there's, there's quite a few um, scholars and theologians who um, t hold this inclusivism view. And a really good book on this is No Other Name by John Sanders. And he has, you know, he has a long list of people in here with um, quotes, and then also the books and writings that that you can find what they said. Um, and so this book is an excellent treatment of, um, it, it goes through the, the various views, uh, that are held that he calls exclude what I would call exclusivism. He calls restrictivism. He also talks about universalism and he talks about why he finds those two views not to be, um, the best view, but, and then he goes into talking about, you know, the, the wider hope views with it, including inclusivism. So another modern scholar that has written on this is Clark Pinnock. And this is another book I recommend, A Wideness in God's Mercy. And so Clark Pinnock is another one who holds to inclusivism and has written extensively on that. Awesome. Yeah, that'll be great for people to check out. Uh, so can you talk about some misconceptions? I mean, obviously you can mention uh, something about universalism. People, this is obviously something that a lot people confuse with universalism. Can you talk about the difference and maybe other uh, misconceptions? Yes. And, you know, there may be some people who are watching this now who just like, want to shout and say, this is not biblical. And 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 the, the misconception that people often have is what you one one of them is what you just said, universalism. So. Um, universalism is the idea that everyone will be saved. And that is not what inclusivism is teaching. You know, to me, I see hundreds of passages in the Bible that talk about, well, I don't know about hundreds, but there's a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about the destiny of the wicked is death. And so there's, it's clear that not everyone will be saved. Um, so the, you know, not everyone will be saved. So inclusivism is not saying that everyone will be saved. It's just saying that, um, you know, people can be saved through Jesus Christ, even if they haven't, you know, done the, the, the hearing of the gospel and the trusting in him directly. Um, okay. Another misconception. Um, another misconception is that inclusivism is saying that all religions are equal or all religions are good. It's not saying that at all. So it's holding very firmly. Inclusivism is saying very firmly that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's the only Lord. There's no other Lord. There's no other there's no other way that a person can be saved except through Jesus Christ. I don't believe that all religions are correct. I don't, I believe that many, um, you know, if they're not confessing Jesus as Lord, then they have a very serious flaw. But I do believe that there is truth in religions. So there are some true things in Islam. It's true that there is one God. It's true that God has a standard and that God is going to judge. And this is truth that is found within that religion. 
Now, um, so, but inclusivism does not say that all religions are equal or that it's okay to believe in whatever religion. So that's, that's the second um, misconception. And I think the main misconception that people have when they hear this, and you sent me an article um, about this that, you know, I'll, I will bring up because they did what is common when it comes to inclusivism. A lot of people react to this by saying, um, you're saying people don't need Jesus in order to be saved. Okay. But inclusivism does not say that people don't need Jesus. Okay. We are saying that people, everyone needs Jesus, but that the, that Jesus can save without people necessarily being aware of how they're being saved. And an example of that from, uh, you know, my own life and experience, I have a friend named Muhammad and, um, Muhammad, I asked him, Muhammad, uh, you know, he's, he's, he has heard what I believe about Jesus, but of course he's, trying to be a good Muslim and a good Muslim would never accept, um, you know, some of the things that Christians teach, but I know him to be a very good and devoted man. I know that he prays that he tries to obey God and that he's good to his family. So I consider Muhammad a righteous man. Now I, when I say righteous, I don't mean he's a sinless man. Obviously he has sin just as we all do, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But in the Bible, there are people who are called righteous, even though they have sin. So Noah was called a righteous man. Now, Noah still had sin in his life, but he was called a righteous man. And there's people, Old Testament and New, who are called righteous. So um, I consider Muhammad a righteous man. Only God knows if he really is, but I see the fruit of righteousness in his life. Now, I asked Muhammad though, Muhammad, do you think your good work, like, do you think you have been good enough to get to heaven? And so I wanted to know, did he think like, you know, it was his, his goodness that was going to save him? And Muhammad's response to that was, um, let's put it, he said, let's put it this way. If it depended on me, then no, I wouldn't make it. And he said, but I know that God is good. And it's because of God's goodness, I believe I'm going to make it. And so this to me is trusting in, that is a, faith that is credited as righteousness. You know, just as Abraham, his faith was credited to him as righteousness. And in the same way, I believe Muhammad will be saved. Now, will he be saved? He won't be saved because of his own goodness. He will be saved because of God's goodness. And the way that he'll be saved is because Jesus Christ died on the cross for his sins and was raised. And even if Muhammad, because of a cultural barrier or whatever, um, doesn't come to recognize that in his lifetime, he will see the Lord and know the Lord on that day. And he'll know that it is Jesus Christ who saved him. That's awesome. Okay, so the um what would you say are the best passages in the bible that talk about uh you know that the reasons why you think that uh, uh inclusivism is true um but could you also talk about some additional reasons outside the bible for why you think it's true yes so the reason that i believe this is the most uh, biblical it is it, it it's a very very strongly supported in the bible um, one passage is from Romans chapter five, and I'll just read that. It says this, starting in verse 15, the gift is not like the trespass for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ overflow to the many, nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. 
The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through the one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Now, you know, this, um, when I think about how powerful Adam's sin was, Adam and Eve sinned and all of us get affected by that, right? Like everyone is affected by that one trespass that entered, that came into the world. Everyone's affected. Now, I don't even have to know who Adam and Eve are to be affected by their trespass, okay? You know, people who have never heard of Adam and Eve, they're still living in a sinful world and they're still sinning. They have been affected by Adam and Eve's sin, whether they recognize that or not, whether they know about it. Now, how this is stating that Christ's act of obedience was more powerful than the trespass. So the, the act of obedience of Jesus Christ was enough to provide life and justification for all people. And so um, now this, at that point, it sounds like universalism, but what I, I'm not saying it's, it's not universalism because there are some who will reject the gift. But the point is that the gift is more powerful than Adam and Eve's sin that affected all of us, whether we know about it or not. So whether you know about it or not, Christ has brought justification and life to you. So um, anyone can receive salvation because of what Jesus Christ did. And so um, that's, that's, that's one of the, the foundational passages. Another one is in Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus, he actually tells, um, he says, this is the where he calls the sheep and the goats, okay? Jesus actually says this at the end, I'm going to gather all the nations, okay? And so, and he says, I'm going to separate them like sheep from goats. And I'm going to say to the sheep, welcome into the kingdom. Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. And then the sheep are going to say to him, Lord, when did we do these things for you? And he says, whatever you did for the least of these, you also did them for me. Now, those sheep were surprised that they were being welcomed in the kingdom. They were surprised that they had served Christ. So this gathering of the nations is not about gathering Christians for judgment. And in fact, for those who interpret this, this uh, what Jesus said about the sheep and the goats, if you interpret that as being about Christians, like Jesus separating some Christians from the other Christians, and some are the sheep and some are the goats, then you really do have salvation by works. Okay, because he's judging them based on their works, okay? But instead, I don't think that this is talking about the judgment of Christians at all. I believe this is the judgment, and this is how Jesus is going to judge everyone else, that he is going to separate them based on what they did. Now, so those who, and what does he say to the goats? He says, depart, you know, you do, you know, go to eternal punishment because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me something to drink. And they're like, Lord, what, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, whenever you didn't do this for the least of these, you didn't do it for me. Goodbye. Now, so what's happening here is that, you know, this is, this is showing it's look, trusting in Christ 
is a wonderful thing because you can have assurance of salvation. But there are people who are living today who they may not have actually heard the gospel, but their hearts are drawn toward God. They're, they're following what God wants them to do by loving other people, by doing good. Now, it's not that those good works are saving them. They're saved because of what Jesus Christ did. But those good works that they did showed where they belonged. It showed whose kingdom they wanted to be part of. So um, those are some of the passages. Um, another one is, you know, 1 Timothy 4.10, which says, Jesus Christ is the savior of all men, especially those who believe. Now, especially those who believe. Yeah, especially those who believe. We know we have a savior and we we're, I'm thankful to know that I have that salvation. But his salvation extends broader than just those of us who are blessed enough to know that he is the savior. And by the way, there's a lot more in the Bible that speaks about this view. Um, you know, there's, you know, we have all the passages in the Bible that talk about the destiny of the wicked versus the destiny of the righteous. So I hope you don't mind if I expound a little bit more on what's in the Bible about this. Um, but basically, you know, the Bible talks about uh, God, that the destiny of the righteous, that, you know, the righteous will not be forsaken by God, that the path of the righteous is immortality. Um, and, and so, um, and then that the destiny of the wicked is death and destruction. Now, Jesus said, uh, he said, I'm trying to find this first because I have it somewhere. You know, he said, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Now, I think that can be applied to this situation because in Christian theology, we often focus on Christ providing salvation for us, that it's not by our works, but it is by our faith in Christ that we are justified, that we're forgiven of our sins, that we have salvation, that eternal life is a gift. And I love those blessed treasures. Those are the new treasures. Those are the treasures that we learn because Jesus Christ died for us. And, and, and we have all the, the, the letters of Paul and the gospels that tell us what he accomplished for us. And, and so we have this wonderful treasure of assurance of salvation and knowledge of for complete forgiveness of sins. But as disciples of the kingdom, we still have the old treasures to pull out of the storeroom. And the old treasures that were there from in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, the old treasure that I think often gets lost is this teaching about the righteous versus the wicked, that there are, there are people that God is looking at and, and saying, yes, I approve of you. You are righteous. Doesn't mean they're sinless. It doesn't mean they don't need Jesus, but there are people who are doing the works that God um, is pleased with. And there are, and, and, and so we can recognize that. We can also recognize that throughout the Bible, God has been very concerned about the poor. And so there are many promises given to the poor in scripture about God's care for the poor. And the poor, you know, in Jesus, even when he quotes Isaiah about his mission, he says he's bringing good news to the poor. Now, I have to tell you that most of the poor who have ever lived on this earth, never got to hear the gospel. So one of the reasons that I believe that inclusivism is true and it will help Christians to embrace this view is because it, 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 it remembers the character of God and his promises to the poor. It helps us see that God's salvation is 
not limited to the elite who got the right knowledge. It is his salvation is for everyone and it's especially for the poor. It's especially for those who never got educated and got to read the Bible. It's especially for those people. And so what inclusivism allows is for God to fulfill his promises to the poor. And, um, you know, that we can recognize that even if they didn't get the right information, that God is taking care of them. And so, um, you know, because if, if, you know, if people who don't hear the gospel cannot be saved or who, you know, didn't get the right information about Jesus, maybe they even got presented in some way about Jesus, but if they didn't get the right uh, presentation of Jesus Christ, then what, what we're really saying, like it, it, it causes us to ignore God's promises and care for the poor that is talked about throughout the scripture. Um, my other reason for believing in inclusivism is my experience with people of other religions and in particular, my experience with Muslims. And that's why I wrote my book. I actually, I wanted Christians to get, um, and here's my book, by the way. So my, I wanted Christians to get a glimpse into the life of Muslims because a lot of Christians never encounter Muslims or if they, what they see about Muslims is negative. They see, um, you know, people blowing other people up. And that is, that is true, true. There's, there's a very bad side of Islam. And so I don't want to minimize the bad side of Islam, but there are many Muslims who are faithfully praying to God, worshiping him, being more devoted in their actions than I am for sure, because, you know, and, and, and in whom I've seen the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you know, where I can, I just see their lives full of love and joy and peace and the things that come from the, the connection with God. And so, and a lot of people get scared when I say that because they're afraid that I'm saying it's, you know, it's good to be Muslim, you know, or that Islam is correct or that Islam teaches the same God as the Bible. I'm not Islam. The, the depiction of God in Islam is much different than the depiction of God in the Bible. So I'm not at all equating those gods. But what I believe about Muslims is that they are worshiping the true God, because they are trying to worship the creator. And when anyone is trying to worship the creator, even if they have a bunch of theological errors, they can still be in contact with the creator. And I mean, just think about how many of us, when I, when I first got in contact with God, when you first got in contact with God, did you have perfect awareness of who he is? And, uh, you know, and even now, do you have perfect theology? No, no, definitely not. Yeah. And so in the same way, God doesn't require perfect theology in order to help people provide for them, answer their prayers. And many Muslims have very deep experiences with God. You know, some of my friends have been refugees. They've been shot at. They've trusted in God when times were really, really hard. And they're their connection with him is very deep. And so that's part of just, uh, you know, why I came to embrace the inclusivist view is because of my experience with people of great, great faith who were not yet Christians. Now, I still hope that they'll become Christians. And many of my Muslim friends have become Christians. But we have to understand that, you know, it sometimes takes time for that revelation to take hold. Uh, Rebecca, could you talk about, you know, one of the stories in your book, um, up to you about what you think is the best one to talk about. But, uh, one I really liked was I, it was a while ago when I read it, but 
you talked about how there was one girl that she she like grew up Muslim, she wasn't Muslim, and then she converted to Christianity, and like she, I guess you know, really changed like as a as a person and all that. But then she still held on to some of her Muslim beliefs purely because she had not been educated on you know what Christians believe. And it's like, and if you ask her, like, she'd be a Christian, but she also holds to some Muslim beliefs. And it's like, well, like, are we going to say that she's not a Christian purely because she holds on to some of these wrong beliefs? Like, that'd be weird. But we'd also say that she accepted the gospel. So um, that's just one. Uh, Maybe you can talk about more if you want to, or maybe a different one. Uh, Could you talk about that? Hey, chat. Subscribing to our YouTube channel allows us to help our watchers understand the Bible better. Thanks to your help, we have already reached thousands of people in their walk with Christ. If you'd like to help further our efforts, tap the subscribe button, which will allow us to reach even more people. You forgot to tell them to turn on bell notifications. They have to subscribe and click a bell now. Yeah, and I think you pretty much told that story. So, um, but yes, that was somebody who she had the gospel revealed to her by God. She believed and trusted in Christ, but she still believed that Muhammad was a prophet. And so does does it really matter if she's trusting in Jesus Christ as her savior? You know, does it matter if she still believes that Muhammad is a prophet? Well, there's going to be some people who say, yes, it's still important because if she believes in Muhammad, then she believes in the Quran and da, 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 da. But most people are not thinking along those terms. They're not, they don't have a systematic theology where everything, you know, is laid out perfectly and makes sense. Um, But what I saw in her life, this was one of my Persian teachers and she, um, you know, every bit that she heard about Jesus, she loved and she held on to that. And so um, I, you know, and she she believed the gospel. So, um, but I will, I would love to tell a story just about, you know, a Muslim friend who, as far as I know, he's still a Muslim today. I don't know if he um, has come to know Christ, but I still have, I have hope for all my Muslim friends that they will come to know Christ in their lifetime. But this one, you know, he, he was abused as a child and he, you know, grew up in a Muslim family. His father died and his stepmother cared for him and his stepmother was quite abusive to him. So she would lock him up. She would burn him. She uh, was, you know, just really cruel to him. And, you know, in those times, he just had so much despair, but he felt God was with him. He really just felt he, he knew he knew God and he knew God cared for him. But he still had so much despair that he wanted to take his own life. As a teenager, he wanted to commit suicide. And he would sit around and think about ways he could commit suicide. And several times he almost threw himself out into traffic because he wanted to get hit by it. He thought getting hit by a car would be an easy way to commit suicide. But he would, you know, he'd never go through with it because he felt bad about the driver. He didn't want the driver to be guilty of killing someone. So one day he tried to kill himself he he saw a rock that was really heavy but it was light enough that he could lift it up but he lifted o- over his head to drop it on himself because he thought he could crush his head and kill himself and um so he lifted it over his head but there was like it seemed to him like there was some force that kept him from being able to drop the rock on his head, even though it was incredibly heavy and it would be very easy to drop, but he was like physically not able to drop it on himself. And he said from that moment, he realized that God like was in control of his life. And so he, from that moment on, just trusted in God and he just, you know, was just, started, you know, making a turnaround and and having a, a, you know, great journey of faith. And he, as he got older, he became like a very good businessman. And he said, you know, but really my life's work, my most important life's work 
is now I help kids who are orphaned and, you know, kids who just have great needs and stuff. So that's really his life's work. And I feel like he's one of those people that, you know, that Matthew chapter 25 is talking about where, you know, he's not, he is not um, confessing himself as a Christian and recognizing Jesus as Lord. But what is he doing with his life? He's helping those who are in need. He's helping the, the, the poor and needy. And he is completely devoted to God and he's trusting in God. Well, yeah, that's an incredible story. Okay. So let's talk about some objections that people might have. Uh, so, you know, a really common one is John three eighteen, which says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, uh, referring to Jesus. And then, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And it, you know, to a lot of people, this is going to seem to say that Jesus and or John, who's writing this, affirms both that Jesus is the divine son whom God sent to save and that anyone who does not believe in him are already under condemnation. Uh, so <clears throat> how would you understand this verse, given your view? Yeah. And, and, you know, there are these verses like this one, and there's a handful of other verses that seem to contradict inclusivism. However, I think that properly understood, I think it w if we don't take a rigid interpretation of this verse, it's easily understood within inclusivism. And so um, this, I believe, is talking about people who are actively disbelieving. OK, so for example, um, so it's not a passive unbelief like, oh, if you haven't, you know, believed in Christ, if you haven't heard the gospel, then you're condemned already. It doesn't say that. Um, you know, it's basically talking about, hey, those, you know, if you if you don't believe actively. Um, so an example I'd give is, you know, the Pharisees who saw Jesus, they were face to face with Jesus. They saw the works that he did and they still did not believe. And so um, for me, when I read that verse, I see that as someone who is knowingly rejecting Christ. And there's many people in the world who are not knowingly rejecting Christ. They just haven't seen how great he is yet. So what do you think about that? Oh, no, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not the expert here. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, it when I'm not sure, uh, John 3.18, is, is that the context? Um, I mean... Who, who else would they be talking about there if it wasn't for the Pharisees who were actively disbelieving? Uh, maybe we can cut this out here. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's talking to Nicodemus. Uh, so that's yeah, that's interesting. That makes a lot of sense. So mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Here's another objection. So. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're saying that people who do good but don't believe in Jesus would still be saved. Can you explain how this isn't a works-based salvation? Yes, and I to say that is one of the biggest misconceptions that people are thinking I'm saying people are saved by their works. No, I, I'm, I am saying that um, like no one can be saved by their works, right? Like all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We were all headed for destruction and death, but we have been, uh, we've had a beautiful thing done for us. Jesus Christ died so that anyone, and as I read in that passage in Romans, he gave justification and life to all people. So, um, you know, no one is saved by their works. They are saved because of what Jesus Christ did. But their works in this life show where their heart belongs. You know, Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. And so there are people in this world whose fruit, the fruit of their lives is showing that they are, um, you know, building God's kingdom. So um, it's not that their, their works are saving them but their works are showing where their heart is. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's uh, you're not doing it 
for the goal of you know what you're going to get out of it. You're doing it because I, I guess it's it's right. Uh, is, do you think that's a good way to say it? Yeah, I mean that's that's part of it. Is that you know it's but I mean the 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 part about it them being saved by their works is off the table because it's not it's it's Christ who did the work for the salvation, right? But it's that their works are um there it's kind of it's a demonstration of like which direction they're heading. Are they heading toward God? Do they want to be part of God's kingdom? And it, it's the it's the fruit of their life that shows that. All right. I appreciate that. Well said. So another one is Mark 16, 16. It says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. What do you think about that? Yes. Well, okay. There's a lot of controversy around Mark 16. Okay. Some people don't even think it's authentic as scripture. Okay. So it's not in some of our oldest manuscripts. So some people just get rid of Mark that end that in part of Mark 16 altogether. I personally still hold it as scripture because I believe it didn't have to be in the originals. If the church considered that worthy of saying, you know, at, at whatever point they added it, then, um, you know, I, I, I hold it as scripture. So I do hold that as scripture. Um, but what does it mean? Which baptism is being talked about here? Because some people think there's one baptism in the New Testament. No, there's like six or seven or maybe even eight uses of baptism in the New Testament. So um, and part of the issue with the word baptism is that we have translated, we've transliterated it from the Greek into the English, which causes a problem for our understanding okay baptism is it, it means to be immersed to be dunked and it's usually in water but there's metaphorical uses too now in the new testament you have several different types of baptism that are mentioned um, you've got the water baptism you've got baptism into christ you've got baptism with the holy spirit or into the Holy Spirit, you've got um, the baptism of suffering. Jesus talked about, he said, I've got a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is finished. Now he's not talking about his water baptism because that already happened. He's talking about the baptism of suffering. He was gonna undergo an immersion into suffering, okay? And there's, you know, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So getting dunked in the Holy Spirit, there's a baptism, you know, even the word baptism is used for when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he, and he says, you, you, you wash the, the, the cups and dishes. It's actually baptized. Okay. So the Pharisees baptized their cups and dishes now. So that gets lost in translation. So the point of this is, is which baptism is the one needed for salvation? And I will argue that the ba one baptism talked about that's absolutely necessary for salvation is the baptism into Christ. This is not the water baptism. It is the baptism into Christ where you as a person are immersed in Christ. You are made one with Christ. You are become part of the body of Christ. And so um, I when it, when it says whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, well, I believe this is talking about the baptism into Christ because there are people who were saved who didn't get water baptized. Um, you know, the thief on the cross didn't get water baptized. Um, you know, the, the Old Testament saints, they didn't get water baptized. There's a lot of people who got saved without getting water baptized. John the Baptist. Well, okay. He was the baptizer. He probably got water baptized. But anyway, the point is that it, what, what needs to happen for somebody to be saved is the baptism into Christ. And so, um, I believe that people can be, um, you know, baptized into Christ without, uh, you know, even being aware of that. Maybe it happens at their death. Maybe it happens after their death. I don't know. Um, 
but okay, then I guess we have the believe part, whoever believes. So, okay, can you read that again? Yeah, sure. So it says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, again, I, I would say this is an active unbelief, right? Like, um, so, and I did mention that I think there's a handful of scriptures that could be used against inclusivism. Um, I think that they have to compete with the, the overall testimony of scripture about, you know, the destiny of the righteous and the wicked. But so um, this could be, I, I'd say this is one of the better supports against inclusivism. But I think, again, for me, the way I would interpret this is that it's an active, this is referring to someone who is actively unbelieving, who's been faced with the truth about Christ. And, you know, it, there's no cultural barrier that's keeping them. There's no, nothing else that's keeping them, but it's, they, they've chosen to reject Christ. And I will, I'll just give a little bit of a counter verse here. You know, Jesus said, all the sins will be forgiven people, even, and, and he said, all the sins and blasphemies will be forgiven people, even when they blaspheme the son of man. But what won't be forgiven is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus even said that people who even blaspheme him, right, will be forgiven. And there's people who are Act, like they're blaspheming Jesus, but they don't realize who they're blaspheming, right? Like there's lots of Muslims and other people of other religions who don't believe Jesus is the Lord. And they're saying things, you know, ah, oh, you Christians, idol worshiper, or, you know, they're, they're blaspheming Christ in various ways, but they may be doing so out of ignorance, not actively rejecting the message of God through the Holy Spirit. So um, the, 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 whoever does not believe will be condemned. I believe that is people who are rejecting the direct testimony of the Holy Spirit as he testifies to them about Christ. And again, going back to the Pharisees, they are an example of that because that's in the context when Jesus talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, it is the, the Pharisees who they have been testified to directly by the Holy Spirit that these signs that Jesus is doing are from God. And um, yeah. they rejected that. Awesome. Okay. Uh, what about John 5, 23? It says that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Yeah. Well, again, I think that is there, there, there are those who are not basically this is, to speaking in the context of those who have the opportunity to honor the son, right? It's, it's a, it's a direct, um, it, it would be a, a more direct rejection of who Christ is rather than just uh, ignorance about him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> When I read that, you know, maybe, I don't know what the Greek word is there. Maybe there's extra context. But when I hear honor, I mean, like, you can honor your parents even if you don't know that they exist. Like, and, I mean, how that exactly works is, like, you know, you could you could live a, you know, a, a Christ-like life or whatever. You could, you could be a good person. You could do great things. And you could end up honoring your parents even if you don't even know who they are. Uh so in that way, maybe like someone that's not a Christian can honor Jesus, the son, with um, just as they honor the father. Um, uh, and you I love that the... answer. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, but you can also, just because you're not honoring, um, you don't actually know that you're honoring the son doesn't mean you're also not honoring both of them. Uh, but yeah, any thoughts on that one? That's awesome. I love that answer. That is a beautiful answer. And I'll add to it that, you know, there are like, for example, with my Muslim friends, they honor Jesus Christ as a prophet. And that's something, right? 
I mean, I'm not, I wish they had the full re revelation of who he is as the son of God, but we have to remember they're being taught from a very early age. Jesus is not the son of God. He's not the son of God. Like he's not this. And they're being like the, having it drilled into their minds to not believe the things that Christians believe about Christ. So, you know, but at the same time, they recognize him as a very important person and they are honoring him. And in fact, they believe that he is going to be the one who's going to judge the world at the end. They believe Jesus is going to come back and judge the world. So they actually have quite a bit of truth about who Jesus is and they are honoring who he is. Yeah, that's that's one of the many interesting things about or Islam. They they often get a lot of it right surprisingly um yeah you know, and and in my culture that i grew up in and so it's like you know they're muslims like they're completely wrong about everything kind of thing and stay away they don't know anything kind of response uh so act 17 30 31 it says the times of ignorance god overlooked but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead uh, so it seems like he's saying it's saying that like you have to repent of of you know your sins, you know which is basically the gospel in a lot of ways, um, but you know you have a lot of people that you know they they haven't repented they you know they don't you know get on their knees and say uh, God Jesus forgive me of my sins or something like that. So how do you deal with that knowing or while also taking the view that people outside of Christianity can be saved. Well, see now I, this passage to me, it's a beautiful example. Like it, it has a lot of that, that kind of, um, you know, is helpful to inclusivism, right? Because Jesus, what, what does Paul say? First of all, he says that in the past, God overlooked this ignorance, right? So we know that God overlooks ignorance. And so, um, but now, and he's also, he doesn't come to them saying, you guys are wrong about everything. You've got to start completely over. Okay. And so in the same way, I think when we approach people from other religions, we don't have to get them to start over at zero and try to introduce them to a concept of God that they, they have no concept of, right? He took the truth that they had. And that's what he used to preach to them. And so if you notice in Paul's sermon, he doesn't say, and now if you, you need to confess that Jesus is the Lord and Savior and trust in him to forgive your sins in order to be saved, he doesn't actually say that. He says, God is going to judge the world in righteousness by the one man he has appointed. So he's he's still not even saying that everyone who doesn't pray the sinner's prayer right now is going to be damned, right? He's he's actually making a pretty inclusive um view. He is telling them they need to repent and turn toward God, but he's also um you know not he's not preaching the exclusive salvation of you know, um, basically like those who don't trust in Jesus Christ are going to be damned. He's saying every God is going to judge the world in righteousness. And that's what I'm saying. Inclusivism does is it lets God be the judge, right? In a way, the exclusivist view takes away God's ability to judge right it's kind of like okay you you say the magic prayer and then you know you're not judged by god but like everyone else is screwed okay if they if they don't say the prayer to jesus right everyone else is screwed but but inclusivism actually allows jesus to be the judge which the bible says he is right jesus is going to judge the world in righteousness and so he will be a righteous judge. And um, and in John chapter five, Jesus um, said, look, the, the, the father, where is it? 
Okay, he says this in John chapter 5, for just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. So here we see that Jesus, he, he has the right to give life to whoever he is pleased to give it. And he is going to judge the whole world on that day. And some people he's going to judge as and say, yes, you're welcome in my kingdom. And um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, did do you feel like I, I'm fully responding to what's going on there in Acts? Or am I leaving something out that you wanted me to address? Uh, well, it seems like to me, uh, you said a lot, there, so I'm going to forget some of it. But it seems like you're saying that... Um, specifically the whole idea of judging like there's you know judging isn't always just like what you've done bad it's also what you've done good um commands all people everywhere to repent <clears throat> um but yeah and then that, that is an interesting point there that it, it specifically judges the world in righteousness because it, so he clarifies uh well, I guess another way to put it is you could say that it's righteous to judge the bad things you've done, uh, but it, but it also could be interpreted as as you're saying. So that's that is interesting. Um, that's something off to think about. Um, but you know, I don't, and, I don't really have a specific opinion. <laughs> well, and let me just clarify: I'm not saying that he's saying he's going to judge just the righteous things. I I don't I think the the what's being said there is that Jesus is going to judge righteously. You know what I mean? Like in his righteousness, he will judge the world and that will include judgments for and against people. So Paul is telling them, you need to repent. You need to turn from, you know, this way of serving all these idols and you need to turn to him. So he is saying that, but I'm just saying like, he, it, it shows us that like the, the thing about the statement about Jesus's judgment leaves it open that it, it it's not, it's not affirming exclusivism. It's affirming that he is the judge, that Jesus Christ is the judge. On a kind of a related note, you said that people that aren't Christian, that God's not actually judging them. Did I uh, say that right? Wait, what do you mean that God's not judging them? <laughs> well, you said that um, if if you take an exclusivist view that uh, that God, uh, you know, everyone else is your, your quotes were everyone else is screwed, but that that when you take a view like yourself, that it's allowing like for God to actually judge them. Yeah. It's like letting God be God, right? Rather than us being the judges, okay? So what I what one problem I see with the exclusivist view is it puts the power of judgment in the hands of human beings and it doesn't allow for God to like judge as he sees fit, right? Because um so like basically if if we know the formula, okay, like our, if our formula, our formula in, in the exclusivist view, the formula is something like, okay, you hear the gospel, you trust in Jesus Christ, and you're saved, okay? And anybody who doesn't fit in that, well, we judge them outside. Like we're saying they cannot be saved, right? So it's basically like making like setting this formula to where humans have the ability to judge and like really i think you know the testimony of the new testament is like i think paul is well i can't even remember where this is written but it says like don't oh yeah it's paul he says don't don't say in your heart who will ascend or who will descend like you know like basically it's not it's not for us to judge the hearts of people there is one judge that's god and so to even make the formula about okay these people are out these people are in it it basically kind of like 
takes the judgment away from God. Does that mean, um, <laughs> do you agree with uh, that? May, well, I don't know. Maybe um, I, I could just see someone like in the crowd saying, well, you know, God's still judging. He's still looking at that person that's not a Christian and saying, hey, you know, they didn't believe in Jesus and that's wrong. And, you know, that itself is a judgment. So are you talking about two different things when you talk about judgment? Or how would how in that situation is God not judging that person? Well, I guess, it, I mean, it just, it doesn't leave opportunity for God to do something di like different, right? Like for God to say, you know, for, for any possibilities, right? Like for God to say, okay, well, you, you know, you didn't hear the gospel, but that was what you had to do. You know, you had to hear the gospel, therefore you're gone. I mean, like, I don't know. It's more like judgment by formula than like God actually judging the heart. Oh, I see. Almost like maybe a way to put it is like, uh, it seems a little not narrow minded. It's, it, it doesn't seem maybe like it doesn't seem the way that we would expect God to judge as as you know from a moral standpoint it's just like uh maybe you're saying like uh you're you're not judging for the right reasons is that a better way to say it well or is that off hmm. <laughs> I I mean it's just um it's it's kind of like judging by a formula rather than actually judging by the heart. Oh. Okay, It's kind of mm -hmm. like this. Okay. So we have judges that have like, you know, there's things that they do by the book, but there's leeway in their judgments. Right. So like, there's like a, you know, they actually, even in our legal system in the U S the judges, they have, there's things they can do. They judge not just by a formula. They don't just, um, you know, anyone, it, it's not computerized. Okay. Like it's not a computerized judgment where each person who comes, okay, here's your crime, but, 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 I'm in, inputting the things of your crime. And then you are, you know, it's, there's, it's not a judgment by formula. It requires the judge to, hear out the case, consider the circumstances, consider the da, da, da. You know what I mean? There's lots of factors that go into making the judgment, right? And so in the same way, I don't think God's judgment of human beings is formulaic in like, okay, didn't hear the gospel. Okay. Da, 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 da. Well, you know, and it, it it's, it's that God actually knows the circumstances. God knows this. He, and he's provided his salvation is powerful enough to extend to everyone. And then he is the righteous judge. So it's him who figures out who belongs there. Now, we do, I believe, have assurance of salvation in Jesus Christ, meaning like if you're a Christian, if you're trusting in Jesus, you already know how God is going to judge you. You already know that you are judged righteous. You already know that you have eternal life. You already know all these things are true. So God has already made you promises about how he will judge you, that he's not going to judge you on your sin. He's going to judge you based on the righteous man, Jesus Christ. But as far as, you know, everyone else is concerned, I don't think that, you know, we can say that there's a formula and that, and they are out. Yeah, no, that actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, mm -hmm. My question in that case is, you know, you, you said you're happy to talk. So, uh, yeah, if if uh, what exactly would be wrong about God judging with a formula if, you know, if that's what he wanted to do? Well, if he wanted to do that, that's up to God, right? Like, I'm not here to dictate what what God um, should do. Um, but what I'm trying to present is what I think we learn about God from the scripture and that God has the salvation of all people in mind that he has, that the gospel is 
um, it, the good news is the good news for the entire world. And that it's not just for those who were lucky enough or blessed enough to be born in the right country, get the right education, get that, but that God actually, just like it says that not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the care of our father, that there is, and there's not even a hair on our heads that's not numbered, but that God has that same care for every person in the world and he has provided salvation for that person and yeah they can reject that salvation and there will be some people who do as crazy as that might be you know just like satan and you know the demons turned against jesus and you know even though they saw him face to face and they saw his glory they turned against him and i think there are some people like that unfortunately but i think you know god has his salvation, we see in the scripture that he is, um, you know, he his the good news is for everyone. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, um, one more question. Uh, do you think Mormons can be saved? I think, yes, and I think many Mormons are saved. Um, I had two Mormon guys in my house this week, um, and I think <laughs> that they are saved. Um, now I can't prove that they're saved and I still, I'm, I'm still testifying to them about, you know, what the scripture says about Jesus. Um, but you know, I think there's enough in the book of Mormon that if that's all they read, they can get saved. Um, but you know, so, but is there a particular reason that you're, you're asking this? Uh, no, that's just a. That's an interesting question, just like the whole Islam and Catholicism of, you know, can they be saved when, you know, there's, 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 you know, growing up as a, you know, a Protestant Baptist or, you know, whatever denomination you're in, it's, it's like, oh, you know, those are the bad guys. Don't listen to them. Uh, you know, only listen to your Christian people. We're the saved ones. They're not Christians. And you, you have lots of Mormons that'll say they're Christian and, you know, Growing up, that's what I always heard all the time. So I wanted to I want to get your thoughts on that one, but uh, but yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I've known a lot of people in the LDS Church in my life, and um, so uh, LDS is their preferred term. So I try to use that, but sometimes I say Mormons. Um, but I and wow, incredibly beautiful, devoted people of faith, and um. I don't want to minimize the the bad teachings that are part of the Mormon church because I mean there's some really awful teachings. I mean it's it's you know when you when you start if you're just reading the book of Mormon you don't get all this but there's some really um you know they believe that they can become gods of their own worlds and you know that basically um we're all spirit babies um, there's, there's a lot of wrong theology, but I think again, God knows the heart. And when I was talking to those two guys, you know, this week in my house, I told them guys, the last thing I would want to do is ever to hurt your faith because I feel that you are the future of, um, you know, you're, you're important. Like your faith is important. And that is my prayer. I live in Utah. So I'm, you know, around a lot of Mormons and my, my prayer is not that, uh, you know, that their faith would be destroyed. I pray that their faith would not fail. And I still, I hope that they come to the full knowledge of who Christ is. And I hope they're able to leave behind a lot of the teachings of the church and and get out of that but at the same time there's something really good there that i hope is preserved and so there's just some really beautiful people devoted to god and i think it depends really zach on what people hold on to and i hope i'm not talking too long about this um okay look there there it depends on what people hold on to because, you know, there are people uh, in the Mormon church 
who read a lot of the Book of Mormon is copied straight out of the Bible. Okay. It's a lot of it's just straight up out of the Bible. And so, I mean, there are people who are reading those teachings of Jesus and absorbing those and, and, and those are changing their lives and they're having a real contact with God. And then there are others who like, for example, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, me and my friend went out to the mall to share the gospel and we ran into an older Mormon man who um, is, you know, an elder or somebody in position in the church. And my encounter with him was very different. I felt it was very dark. And so, um, you know, it was the focus was not at all on the beautiful things of faith, but it was on the authority of the church. And it was very um, just that there, there was a, a great darkness in the things that he was saying. And so I feel like that's an example of somebody who has really imbibed the, the bad teachings of the church and is living those out rather than, um, you know, really taking to heart the, the good things that are present in the religion. Oh, that's really interesting to think about when we're dividing on like, you know, what does it take to be saved and all that, you know, sometimes, you know, when we're in this discussion, you're thinking like, okay, you know, as long as you're a good person, like you're whatever, not, that's not exactly what you're saying, but as long as you're a good person, then you can be saved. You're good. But, you know, a lot of times that, you know, when you go in these religions that have the ability to, you know, have a lot of good things come out of them, there's also a lot of bad things that come out of it. So, yeah, that's really interesting to think about. So, anyways, uh, that's all I got for you, Rebecca. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, any last thoughts or um, where would you point people to learn more about your stuff? Well, I, there are there is one last thought because we were going to talk a little bit about, about does this hinder evangelism? Does inclusivism hinder evangelism? And because that is one of the the concerns that people have about this view, they say, well, hey, if people can get saved without hearing about Christ, then psh, why bother sharing the gospel? Or, you know, why would Jesus send us out to share the gospel? Like, why would Jesus commission us and tell us to share the gospel? Well, the gospel is the best news in the world. It is the news people need to hear. And everyone can benefit from hearing the gospel. Who, who wouldn't want to hear that there's a God who loves them like we ha and that who died on the cross for them to have this revelation of who Jesus Christ is, to have the Holy Spirit, to, to, to be able to experience the blessing of being part of the body of Christ and, and like, like having full awareness of being part of spreading God's kingdom and everything. So for me, my, uh, uh passion for evangelism has not diminished at all since I um, embraced this view of inclusivism. In fact, I think I've become a better evangelist because before I used to do, I, I was very passionate about evangelism, but a lot of it was based on fear because I felt a very great pressure um, to get the gospel message to people because I, I just, everything felt like it was all on the line and there was no possibility of them being saved unless they hear and trust in Christ right now. And that, that was that, so there, there was like a lot of fear and pressure in my evangelism, but now it, there's just such freedom in my evangelism. I'm doing it not, I have no fear. I'm doing it purely out of love for people. I love the people and I want them to uh, get the blessings of the gospel. I want them to get the blessings of knowing Jesus Christ. And so I don't think uh, inclusivism has to hinder your evangelism. Um, where would I point people? Well, I have been creating a playlist on my channel, Bird of Life. So if you want, I can give you that link to the playlist and you can put it in the description or something. Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely, uh, everyone should definitely go check that out. I, I have the few videos I've watched, I've really enjoyed and found very helpful. So anyways, thanks again. This has been awesome. And I really appreciate you talking to us and uh, telling more about this view. I hope you have a great rest of your night, Rebecca. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Zach. I appreciate it.